In 1996, Spokane, Washington is gripped by a series of violent robberies and bombings. The FBI links the crimes to a radical group determined to overthrow the government. Facing deadly traps and a nearly invisible foe, investigators vow to stop the shadowy extremists, ready to unleash more domestic terror. The Constitution of the United States allows for the lawful expression of any belief. But when a paramilitary faction use bombs and robbery to further their cause, they cross the line. The well-organized terror cell was difficult to define and even harder to stop. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the group stockpiled weapons for an assault, the FBI and local police were determined to bring them to justice. Spokane, Washington, a city of 200,000 near the state's eastern border with Idaho. On Monday, April 1st, 1996, two dozen people were working inside a satellite office of the city's Spokesman Review newspaper. At 2.30 p.m., a van pulled up behind the building. It was there less than 15 seconds. Inside, a reporter had finished his work and was looking forward to spending the afternoon with his son. They did not realize what was waiting for them outside. Despite significant damage to the building, nobody was injured. Units from the Spokane County Sheriff's Department responded to the 911 calls. The reporter and his son had not seen anything suspicious. But one employee said that seconds before the blast, she saw a masked man jump into a white van that sped away from behind the building. She didn't get a license plate number. While much of local law enforcement was at the newspaper office, a white van pulled up outside Spokane's U.S. Bank several miles away. It had been 15 minutes since the newspaper bombing. Two armed, masked men burst into the bank and announced they were robbing it. As they passed her, one teller tripped the silent alarm. Robbers threatened to detonate a pipe bomb if anyone disobeyed their orders. They warned the teller not to give them dye packs, paint canisters designed to explode and stain stolen money, and bank robbers. Once the gunmen had their money, they herded everyone into a corner. They trained their guns on the hostages, allowing valuable seconds to tick by as the fuse burned. Right, 
at the newspaper office crime scene, investigators heard radio reports about the bank robbery and explosion. That scene was secure, so several detectives headed to the new crime scene. And the sheriff's office dispatched more deputies to the bank. At the time, Special Agent Mark Cullinan of the FBI's Spokane Resident Agency was on his way to the newspaper bombing with his partner. While en route, uh, we received a call that, that a bank robbery had occurred. Another bomb had been set off inside the bank. Uh, since my primary investigative jurisdiction was bank robberies, I immediately diverted to, to the bank. The employees and customers were shaken, but safe. They believed everyone had gotten out before the blast. But investigators had not yet declared the crime scene secure. Explosives Disposal Unit Supervisor Sergeant James Goodwin had to make sure it was safe for police to check the building. We were concerned about the possibility of a second device uh, because any time you have an explosive device related incident, you, if you have one, there is always at least a potential that you have another. Bombers sometimes leave a second device behind as a booby trap, specifically to target law enforcement. The explosives disposal unit swept the bank, determining it was clear of additional bombs or victims, and radioed to those outside that it was safe to process the scene. OK, it's all clear. You, you get on the phone and see what you can get. The assailants were fast and organized, getting in and out in seconds and making off with $50,000. They weren't typical bank robbers. Bank robberies are usually conducted by lone individuals who are seeking uh, money to support a drug habit or something uh, along those lines. Uh, to have somebody in an organized manner come in and take over a bank with this much violence and, and uh, prior planning it is an unusual occurrence. Agents questioned one witness who was in the bank's parking lot when the robbery took place. She said after the explosion, she saw two masked men run from the bank and get into a white van. A third man was driving. He had gray hair and a beard. It was a white van. White van. They had the mask on the She had written down the van's license plate number. They learned it had been stolen from Ellensburg, Washington. Spokane Emergency Dispatch issued an APB for the van, and officers began a block-by-block -block grid search of nearby streets. At the newspaper office, FBI agents arrived and questioned the witnesses. The woman who saw the van there also mentioned that the driver was an older man with gray hair and a beard. But the most distinct clues linking the two crime scenes were leaflets containing religious propaganda, a common sight in the area. At the scene of the spokesman review bombing, and also at the bank, we did discover uh, numerous leaflets, which had obviously been left there by the robbers. Religious propaganda is pretty uh, prevalent throughout the area. Uh, a lot of times these groups will leaflet a neighborhood or an area, leaving them under windshield wipers and, and on front doorsteps, uh, just spouting their, their ideals uh, and trying to get their message out. But this group delivered their message with bombs and bank robbery. Sheriff's deputies continued their search for the getaway van. Plate 2233 Union. 
90 minutes after the bank robbery, one deputy spotted it in a parking lot a mile from the bank. From the back, he couldn't tell if the robbers were there. No one was inside. Dispatch advised the deputy that the van could be rigged with a bomb. The explosives disposal unit arrived in minutes. They knew the suspects might have booby-trapped the vehicle. If there was a bomb in the van, its trigger device could be radio controlled. Since police radios can set off such triggers, investigators ordered all radios turned off. Because they had enough open space to do so, they used a robot with a camera to check the van first. We initially sent the robot downrange uh, in an attempt to look into the van. Uh, we found that we were, we were uh, limited in what we could see, and um, we sent a technician downrange near the van uh, in a bomb suit. The others waited in the mobile command center for the technician's report. Even in the most dangerous situations, bomb technicians need to keep their hands uncovered in case they have to perform delicate tasks. It is an unavoidable risk of the job. He smelled uh, gasoline, saw what he thought to be gasoline uh, coming from uh, underneath one of the doors to the van, and saw what appeared to, to him to be uh, time delay device that appeared to be intended to ignite the gasoline. Since the trigger was a time delay, not radio controlled, it was safe to resume using radios. Attached to the wick, the technician saw a small initiator, an element that sets the wick burning. And cousin Cindy are in that route. And what would you like to do with it? So I looked at this, I can probably ready safe it. Mark, before you, before you go ahead and separate the two, would you let us know that you're going to do it? In an effort to preserve any evidence the van might contain, the bomb squad technician was putting his own safety in jeopardy. Okay, go ahead and make the cut. Good, get it out of there. It worked. Okay, he's got it. He's got it out of there. In the van, investigators found another copy of the manifesto the robbers left behind at the bank in newspaper bombings. Right down here at the here. To FBI Special Agent David Bedford, the rhetoric in the letter was typical of white supremacist militia groups in the area. That was more or less a long religious sermon about usury, a biblical term referring to the charging of interest. Um, and the thing that stood out most about this letter that was left behind was a symbol on the page. Compare with this one right here. Agents knew they could get help analyzing the manifesto from a spokesman review reporter. Bill Moreland is an expert on extremist groups in the area. For the past 22 years, I've covered uh, hate groups here in our area in the Northwest, uh, chief among them the Aryan Nations, which is 35 miles from Spokane in North Idaho. It's attracted a lot of uh, different extremists from different movements, anti-tax movement, uh, anti-abortion movements, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, Posse Comitatus. The FBI showed Moreland the robber's manifesto. It was clearly white separatist dogma, uh, but what intrigued me most was what was on the bottom of that note. It was a, the Christian cross superimposed with a capital P, and it's what I knew to be the logo of the Phineas priesthood. 
Individuals who call themselves Phineas priests say the crimes they commit are in accordance with their interpretation of God's law, sometimes robbing banks to finance a plot to overthrow the federal government. Moreland told agents about an interview he had done months earlier. As part of a story, he'd arranged to meet several members of an extremist group at a clandestine location. They did not identify themselves as Phineas priests, but they professed some similar beliefs. When we got there, we saw seven or eight individuals who were heavily armed, automatic weapons, street sweeper type shotguns, sidearms, all dressed in uh, uh, army camouflage type material. They went through a number of exercises for our benefit. The men explained they worked in cells with no formal leader, no strict organization. This leaderless resistance was designed to make it difficult for law enforcement to track them. They said they were preparing for an armed confrontation with the federal government. I said, well, what happens if you're driving home from this event, from this training exercise, with all your guns and your military equipment? If a police officer were to stop you on a traffic offense, what would you do? And uh, the individual I was talking to said, didn't hesitate for a minute, he said, I would kill him. I'd kill the police officer. When we're equipped like this, he said, we're running hot, and we would shoot to kill any police officer that stopped us to protect the identity of our group. Agents believed the bank robbers they were after were every bit as dangerous and elusive. After masked men robbed a bank in Spokane, Washington, and detonated bombs at the bank and a newspaper office, authorities suspected well-armed extremists who called themselves Phineas Priests. Spokesman Review newspaper reporter Bill Moreland is an expert on extremist groups in the Pacific Northwest. The FBI asked him for details about self-professed Phineas priests known to commit violent crime in the name of religion. They're secret groups, and they come together with five or six or seven of their, of their fellow people that are fellow believers and decide to carry out some sort of action. They don't tell the world about it, and you can't look them up in the phone book or on the internet. They're very secretive. They believe that God is one of their members and that they're following his directions to carry out these crimes that they commit. Special Agent David Bedford was part of the team investigating extremist groups in the area. And here's one more thing. I wonder if you get a chance later on. This they found right nothing here. related to the recent bombings. We had very few leads to go by after the uh, robbery. The individuals were masked. They wore camouflage clothing. They wore gloves. Um, very few leads to work with, other than a composite drawing of the getaway driver. The FBI hoped to have more than a vague drawing before going to the public to reduce false leads that take up time and resources. But they could not wait any longer. So what we did was publish that and sent copies all around Washington, Oregon, Idaho, with the idea, with the hopes of someone identifying this person. Information that was called in was filtered through the FBI's Rapid Start program, a database system designed to collect and organize large numbers of leads so they can be prioritized. Oh, actually, I do see it's just south of... Uh... We received hundreds and hundreds of tips or possible leads of who this individual was. And so a team of agents would go out and investigate all of these people who came in that were um, look-alikes. One by one, they eliminated suspects. James Johnson, no longer suspect. Despite spending hundreds of man hours following every viable lead, investigators came up with nothing. The case stalled. Until the assailant struck again. On July 12th, three months after the first attacks, a woman spotted a masked man placing a bomb in front of a Spokane health clinic.
She called in the getaway van's license plate number. Spokane's 911 call center dispatched fire and police personnel to the scene. Baker 504, I'll be checking here. Like a dozen others, Deputy Dan Spivey of the Spokane Sheriff's Office started off toward the clinic. What the deputies didn't know was that the U.S. bank that was robbed in April was being hit again. This time there were three masked gunmen instead of two. Like the earlier robbery, the assailants had a bomb. One teller recognized the voice of one of the robbers and set off the silent alarm as she loaded up. Hurry up, hurry up, let's go! Now! The men moved efficiently, spoke in code, and seemed to be timing the robbery. They didn't notice the drive through teller who worked in a separate part of the bank. Zip it up, please. While those inside the bank were staring down the barrels of guns, everything appeared normal to customers on the outside. Hello? Hoping the robbers had not heard the customer over her loudspeaker, Hello? the drive through teller tried to get him to help. She didn't know if the customer understood her gestures. If he would help or run. Deputy Spivey was almost to the clinic when he got a more urgent call. Baker, 504, I, copy. I heard a bank robbery in progress come out at the same US bank that had been robbed on April 1st. But before deputies arrived, one of the assailants announced they were at code blue, and they left. Taking $37,000 in cash and the bomb with them. The drive through customers saw the men get in their van. He decided to tail them and called 911 as he drove. The plate he reported did not match the one from the health clinic, but criminals often put two different plates on stolen vehicles to confuse investigators. Spokane Emergency Dispatch advised the man not to put himself in danger. He said he would follow at a safe distance until deputies caught up. Police hoped the customer would not be spotted by the armed assailants. In July 1996, authorities believed members of an extremist militia group robbed the U.S. bank in Spokane, Washington for the second time in three months. A customer saw the robbers leave in a van and followed. Deputy Dan Spivey was en route to the bank when he heard about the pursuit. Our dispatch advised us that a citizen with a cell phone was following that suspect vehicle, and they in turn were relaying location information to us field deputies. Spivey changed directions to try to catch up. The customer gave constant updates on his location but had a hard time keeping up with the suspect's van while not being spotted. Behind a mall area, the citizen lost the vehicle. And I quickly searched the area, attempting to locate such a vehicle. It was unsuccessful. Uh, decided to go back through the area in a more slow, methodical manner. After an hour of searching, Spivey drove into a parking lot above the downtown area. I checked an upper parking lot and at the far end of the parking lot saw what I believed to be the suspect vehicle. Excuse me, ma'am. Would you leave the area right now, please? Get on the other side of the lot. Sir, could you get away from that vehicle and go down towards the other end of the lot? Thank you. Baker 504 rear plate, 2233 two, Victor. One plate matched the one from the bank robbery. Uh, 
and the other from the health clinic bombing. No one appeared to be inside. I'll be backing off and standing by. Explosives Disposal Unit Supervisor Sergeant James Goodwin, who helped defuse a bomb in a van after the April bank robbery, declared the vehicle an explosive hazard. Given the history, we had a concern that this vehicle may, may contain a device as well. The natural thing to expect, given this was kind of the second go-round, was that having uh, been unsuccessful the first time, um, they, would, they would try harder the second time. Deputies smelled a strong gasoline odor. But again, it was difficult to see what kind of device might be inside. Rather than risk sending in a squad member, explosives disposal technicians once again deployed their specialized robot. The technicians operated the robot remotely from the safety of inside the EDU truck. We sent the robot down range uh, in an effort to scout the vehicle and see what we could see. The robot was equipped with a video camera, remote-controlled eyes for the explosives disposal unit. Technicians guided the robot to peer inside the van looking for a bomb. The windows of this particular van had been darkened, so um, we weren't able to see much of anything at all. They tried the robot's lights. Oh, too much window tint on I can't see anything out of the back either. Yeah, awesome. There seemed to be something in the van, but the robot's camera still couldn't see clearly through the window tinting. Can't see anything out of that window, can you? Oh, no. They needed to know what the object was. We elected to use the robot uh, to shoot a window out of the van and open it so that we could see inside. The technicians then activated the robot's water cannon disruptor, which fires a slug by water pressure rather than gunpowder, so sparks are less likely. All right. Nice job, buddy. You know, why don't we see if we can get some of that glass right out of the window so we've got a good view of the inside. Okay. They used the robot's powerful claw to clear the glass. Once the window was broken, uh, we were able to see inside the van and observe what appeared to be an incendiary device. It looks like a couple propane cylinders, timer, and I'm not sure what that is, yeah, taped into the timer. It looks like an initiator. Right down here? Yeah. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back into the window. It appeared that it was intended to uh, initiate a fire in the van, burn the van, uh, thereby leaving us very little evidence. The explosives disposal technician guided the robot to clear the bomb from the van. He then moved the bomb to a more remote area so they could render it safe. There it is. They again used the water cannon disruptor. Take your shot when you're ready. Ready? All right. Yeah, open it right up. In the protective suit, a technician checked the bomb and confirmed it had been rendered safe. Yeah, it looks like he's all clear down there. Once again, the suspects had used a stolen van. But this time, investigators found no manifestos or other evidence inside. Although there were three assailants in the latest robbery, the FBI believed the same individuals robbed the bank three months earlier. For help, they turned to forensic examiner Richard Vorderbrugge of the FBI's Audio, Video, and Image Analysis Unit. Similar clothing and weapons suggested two of the gunmen took part in both robberies. 
Vorderbrugge analyzed surveillance video to determine their heights. I used a technique called perspective analysis photogrammetry. Uh, that involves taking a set of measurements of fixed objects within the scene, uh, determining the specific perspective of the scene, that is to say how the camera itself was related to fixed objects within the scene. Because the cameras were facing downward, Vorderbrugge had to use complex mathematics to determine how actual size is reflected at that angle. He then compared the measurements of the fixed objects, such as a table leg, to the relative height of the bank robbers. He concluded the two robbers from the April 1st robbery were very likely two of the three from the July robbery. One of them was approximately five feet, seven and a half inches, and the second robber was approximately six feet, one inch. And by finding, as I did, that the heights of the two individuals in the bank in each case were about the same, it certainly helped strengthen uh, the case that they were the same people involved. With the robberies and bombings likely committed by individuals calling themselves Phineas priests, the FBI elevated the status of the suspects. We decided that they were not here for the sole purpose of uh, robbing a bank and taking the money. These guys had a message that they were trying to get out to the public, and it was causing havoc in the city of Spokane. Uh, a lot of people were concerned about uh, their safety, and as a result, the FBI felt like, um, you know what, these are, these are terrorists. To help capture the domestic terror suspects, the U.S. Bank offered a $100,000 reward. Despite the reward, a month passed with no new leads. Agents believed the terrorists were out there training, getting ready to strike again. After authorities linked several robberies and bombings in Spokane to a suspected group of domestic terrorists, the targeted bank offered a $100,000 reward and the FBI released a composite sketch of the getaway driver. A month after the second bank robbery in August 1996, the reward offer generated a promising lead. An informant came forward saying he thought he knew the man in the composite sketch. The informant, a licensed firearms dealer, believed he met the man and a few others several months earlier. It was before the bank robberies began. He sold a group of men military clothing and equipment. The, uh, One of the men looked like the driver in the sketch. The informant said they asked about buying plastic explosives and a bazooka. Then they asked for his help outfitting their SUVs with tank armor and bipod-mounted machine guns. But he wanted nothing to do with such illegal activities. Before he left, one of them bragged that a small group of well-prepared men was going to bring the banking establishment to its knees. The informant said he met the men at an auto repair shop owned by one of them. The shop was located in the small town of Sandpoint, Idaho, about 75 miles northeast of Spokane. In late August, the FBI went to Sandpoint to investigate the lead. Agents rented an abandoned building with a view of the auto repair shop and discreetly watched the suspects as they outfitted their SUVs. FBI Special Agent Mark Cullinan believed they might have found the robbers. When observing these uh, subjects' daily activities, it was suspicious to us First of all, that they didn't have any uh, noticeable means of employment, that was an indicator to us uh, that, that they're gaining money or the means to operate uh, through other methods. Since we didn't know what had happened to the money from the bank robberies, uh, this was a possibility. Agents photographed the suspects and anyone seen on the premises. One of the individuals we identified as Robert Barry. Barry ran uh, an automotive repair shop uh, 
uh, in the Sandpoint area, but didn't seem to be doing any business, didn't seem to be using it to, to generate any income. Agents identified a second suspect as Charles Barbie. Although Barbie had no record of convictions, he had been arrested for trying to buy supplies from military personnel. Barbie and Barry matched the heights of the bank robbers given by forensics experts. The FBI determined the third man was Vern Merrill. Merrill appeared to be the leader of the group. And he resembled witness descriptions of the getaway drivers seen at the bombings and bank robberies. Agents needed more information on the men. They took a risk to get it. Go ahead and kill the light. Kill the light. One night in early September, after the suspects left the shop, surveillance teams installed a hidden video camera on a telephone pole behind the garage. Agents didn't know if the area was booby-trapped or if they themselves were being watched. The teams got out safely. Looks like they're shooting a assault rifle. What the camera revealed was chilling. Agents watched the men test different weapons and types of bullets to see which could pierce the steel of car doors and the Kevlar of bulletproof vests. It was clear they were preparing for battle. During weeks of surveillance, the FBI tailed the suspects from the ground in the air as they drove to various cities in the Pacific Northwest. Agents believe the men were casing banks. Suspects are heading west on Spring Avenue. On September 6, 1996, two months after the second robbery, the bank, newspaper office, and health clinic previously targeted received threatening letters promising further violent attacks. Some sort of stationary surveillance. Authorities developed contingency plans that would allow them to follow the robbers to their next target. So far, they've hit us twice. They can't. Wherever it might be. But that's not to say they couldn't take any of the other back roads uh, down to meet or intersect I-90. So what we have to do is come up with points far enough away that they can't take a back road and get around behind us uh, before getting in their home territory up there. A month later, on October 8th, Investigators on the stakeout observed what they believed were final preparations for another bank robbery. Okay, listen up, unit. They're all leaving now. Three white male occupants. Plant they contacted Special Agent David Bedford. Six nine two one three. They're leaving now. I received a phone call from the agent that was actually watching them load up. I started calling a lot of other coworkers, saying get in your car, start heading towards Sandpoint because something's going on and we need everybody up there as soon as possible. And so we began our surveillance, not knowing where they were going to end up. The FBI tailed the suspects as they headed west out of Sandpoint. Their license plates indicated the truck was to be used in a crime. But the plates on the Suburban did not match front to rear and both had been reported stolen. This also added a new sense of urgency to our investigation. They followed the men 400 miles west, across the Oregon border. The individual looks like he's breaking into a van. In Hood River, Oregon, agents watched the men steal a van from a used car lot and add it to their convoy. If the FBI was correct, the suspects planned to use the stolen van in a bank robbery and abandon it afterwards. We observed the vehicles uh, stop at a truck stop. Uh, 
where they shifted some gear between vehicles, they did some moving around and some planning, and then they departed again in one vehicle. As agents shadowed the van, they realized where the suspects were headed. By approximately 6 o'clock in the morning, we were hundreds of miles away from where we had started and on the outskirts of Portland. We watched them drive a meandering route into the city. By 10 o'clock, it was clear which Portland bank the suspects intended to hit. They're making a left into a parking lot. Appears to be a bank. And as we uh, watched them pull into one of the bank parking lots, we notified the bank. They immediately locked the doors to the bank, keeping all of their customers and everybody inside. And our plan was, as they exited the vans to go up and enter into the enter the bank to Robert, we were going to arrest them. What do you think? Agents waited for the suspects to make their move. Good here. Good I like it. All right, they're in front of the bank. I was approximately 30 yards away from them. And with my binoculars, I could see exactly what they were doing inside the van. And that was pulling out their, their guns. They were donning masks. They were putting on their camouflage gear. And they were getting ready to make a break towards the bank. And it was at that time they saw the same things that we saw. The uh, customers that were trying to get into the bank were unsuccessful because the bank had been locked. It looked like the suspects were standing down. The field agents called in for instructions. Let's keep surveillance on the vehicle. Our agents were conferring with the United States Attorney's Office, with uh, the heads of our divisions, and making a determination as to whether we had enough evidence at this point uh, to arrest these subjects. While the team conferred, surveillance units followed the stolen van as the suspects retrieved their Suburban. They started driving back towards Washington, and we continued to follow them. Soon they got the go-ahead for the arrest. Now they needed to find the safest opportunity to do so. On the next stop, all units converge. The subjects stopped for gas at uh, Union Gap, Washington. We decided that that was a, a, the best place that we had in order to effect an arrest. But with such violent and heavily armed suspects, there was no guarantee of a safe arrest scenario. After months of investigating domestic terror suspects, Surveillance units tailed them to a Union Gap, Washington gas station. Two of the suspects stayed in one of their vehicles, while the third entered the gas station. With the suspects split up, the lead agent put the operation in motion. Temple. They needed to synchronize the arrests, so all three suspects were surprised. FBI, you're under arrest. Don't move, you're under arrest. FBI, you're under arrest. Put your hands on the car. 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 The better the vehicle. Put your hands on the car. Vern Merrill. Robert Berry. And Charles Barbie were arrested without a fight. Special Agent David Bedford discovered things could have gone much differently. Following the arrest, we did a search of the vehicles they were driving. We found hand grenades, uh, thousands of rounds of ammunition, um, probably half a dozen different types of weapons, gas masks, tear gas canisters. 
um, these guys were definitely ready for battle. Agents also found a threatening letter to the Spokane bank that had been robbed twice. Despite the three arrests, the FBI knew one suspect was still at large. One of the things that was a question in our minds was on the uh, July 12th robbery, there was three people that came inside and a getaway driver. We were still unsure who the fourth robber was. Agents interviewed friends and associates of the arrested suspects. They learned the fourth man was most likely Brian Radigan. One of the things that concerned the FBI was Brian Radigan's military experience. He apparently had some training in sniper school, and so the surveillance, the investigation that we did uh, regarding Brian was very careful, very thought out. Those who knew Radigan said he was heavily armed, well trained, and paranoid. I'll just throw that in there. All right. The FBI wanted to avoid a violent confrontation, as did the suspect's family. We solicited help from Brian Radigan's family members who, after talking to them some t for some time, felt that it would be in his best interest if he came forward and was arrested. And so a family member sent a train ticket to Brian and his wife. The ticket was for a phony departure at a time when the FBI knew no other passengers would be at a Washington state train station. Undercover agents posed as station employees. When Radigan seemed at ease, they made their move. Radigan had no way to fight back or run. He and the others would be tried for their crimes, not their political or religious views. The FBI does not investigate individuals or groups based on their beliefs. We investigate crimes. We investigated these acts because they were violent crimes. They were bombings, they were bank robberies. Uh, we would investigate them as we would any other uh, violent crime. On July 24, 1997, Charles Barbie, Robert Berry, and Vern Merrill were found guilty on eight counts related to the bombings and armed robberies and were each sentenced to life in prison. In a separate trial, Brian Radigan was found guilty of similar charges and sentenced to 55 years. Although that one Phineas Priesthood cell is behind bars, the FBI and experts like Spokesman Review reporter Bill Moreland know other domestic terrorist groups are still out there. Since 1996, uh, the number of militia cells has dropped off, but I believe there still are a number of them out there, and they're as hardcore and deeper underground than ever, and every bit as dangerous. If these groups do commit crimes, the FBI will not stop until they are dismantled.